I know you wanted to talk about some sad news that just came in, and apparently it reflects something that happened a few weeks back. But a wrestling historian, or actually, I guess, more appropriately, a wrestling reporter for so many years just passed away. Uh, yeah, Koichi Yoshizawa, who was in the glory days of the 60s and 70s and 80s of Japanese wrestling magazines, was like the the name photographer, the name that anybody in the United States knew related to Japanese wrestling. Um, I, I guess he was 73 years old, passed away, as you said, a couple of weeks ago. We just found out about it. And I honestly hadn't had any interaction with him in, God, 40 years now, probably. But before uh, I got into wrestling, when I was a photographer and et cetera, was writing and shooting pictures for the magazines here, Koichi is the guy that got my stuff in Gong magazine in Japan. Gong Weekly was the, what was it? There were, there were two, Weekly Fight and Gong were the two major wrestling magazines in those years, right? They were monthly, and then they became weekly when things really got hot in 83. Everything, uh, 83 into 84, everything went weekly, but originally That's Gong, true. Gong had a couple of magazines. There was also a Weekly Pro, I guess it was just pro wrestling before it was weekly pro wrestling. Yeah, but, Baseball they, Magazine Shaw, remember that? Yes, yes, they were done. Weekly Pro was done by the the same publishers, same company did, that did the baseball magazine over there. And, and these were sold on every newsstand and the train stations and any place where sports magazine, any kind of magazines, but major magazines. I mean, these this was uh, whatever their version of Better Homes and Gardens or Newsweek or whatever, these magazines were front and center. They were huge sellers. And they were, the at the time, the most beautiful wrestling magazines in the world. Because, well, here's they how still it happened. Are. They still are. Those yeah. old ones are still better than everything today. Um, I, you know, I started shooting, as you know, for Norm Keitzer and, and the Wrestling News, because when I started taking pictures in Louisville, that was the magazine that, Teeny was selling on the the gimmick tables, and they had a relationship with because Norm did all the different uh, regional versions of his magazine so that it would be more appealing to the fans of particular territories. Remember and, that. Remember that survey in PWI who discovered Jim Cornette? Bill Apter. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, and it, it it was it was Christine Jarrett. Really, if you want to go back that far, because she told me to send some pictures, you know, to Norman Kaiser to get him into wrestling news, right? So she could sell more magazines. If I could just jump in, because I recently went through a lot of this stuff, I have all the back and forth paperwork between Norm Kaiser and Christine Jarrett. Oh my God. I someday, You got to copy that stuff for me sometime. Yeah, yes, I will. And you, of course, replaced noted photographer Pat Malone. <laughs> He's just a fantastic photographer, I must say. Pat probably never even had a camera in his hand in his entire life, but he would get pictures from Mike Shields or Scott Teal or whoever, and he would send them to Norman Keitzer because he wanted to say he was the one in Memphis and Nashville selling the magazines. He'd find 12 year old kids that wanted to get in the matches free, and he'd say, Come here, boy, sell me 10 magazines. Go out right now. And they were, what, a dollar or $2 or whatever. And they'd go out and sell the magazines, bring bring the money back, and he'd give them ten percent or whatever, so they'd go get a fucking drink. But anyway, but he would say he would send the pictures in, and and Norman was such a, as Jim Ross once said about Bob Caudle, the epitome of a white man wearing brown shoes. He didn't want to insult anybody, so he credited Pat Malone as the photographer for whatever he said. <laughs> Some of my early stuff is is by Pat Malone. Yeah, because I know some of your early stuff, and I also know your handwriting. So some of your early stuff yeah. is definitely attributed to Pat Malone. But anyway, so nevertheless, I started doing that. And then that's when, after I'd been around, you know, doing it for maybe, I guess, about a, was it a year, year and a half? Then I got in contact with wonderful Willa Apta. Uh, because Lawler was getting a, a more prominent name nationally and they needed stuff and blah, blah, blah. But in between there somewhere, because I've got to go back and look at the magazines and see the cover dates to remember after 45 years. But I think I started appearing, my work started appearing in the Japanese magazines before 
even in Bill's uh, London publishing magazines. And what happened was I got a letter from Koichi Yoshizawa. And now come to find out, I mean, I didn't know at the time his name was everywhere in relation to Japanese wrestling, but he corresponded with everybody that was a smart fan or a photographer or, you know, somewhere in the the American magazine or publicity, you know, wrestling enterprise. And you've seen him because you've got him in the files there, but he would send you result sheets that he he wrote by hand and had copied on a copier and he was uh, apparently i never spoke to him on the phone ever because in the 70s and 80s you didn't just talk to somebody in japan on the fucking phone what are you know mama Cornette would say what am i a millionaire well you want to hear something crazy kids listening today anyone listening today who was born after let's say 2000 they have no idea what long distance is they don't understand that that costs so much more than a phone call down the street oh jesus yeah i don't even know what it was to call fucking japan back then but it would have been like what the equivalent probably of 20 dollars a minute today so anyway but he would he sent a letter and say hey would you like to send you know results uh photos whatever yeah sure and the result sheet that he sent he would write out by hand, like I said, and even though he spoke English and could write English, and that's how he was able to navigate the the two worlds, still, when when a Japanese person learns to write English, there's a flourish to it. You know what I'm talking about because you've seen his writing. And he would do it like on a, a piece of copy paper, but it would be folded over like a brochure, and you'd see the some results here just it, and almost no space between the paragraphs, just endless results and dates and towns. And then you'd open it, it would be folded over, you'd open it up and there was more in the middle and maybe the back would even be horizontal, whatever, right? And But it, he was giving you the results of all of the matches that happened anywhere for both companies in Japan, Baba and Anoki. And the you know, when I started sending pictures, I don't know that he ever clarified that he wanted pictures for the magazine. He said, please send pictures of so-and-so and such-and-such, -and -such, right? A couple of names, and I did. And then a few months later, here, and this, it was either late 1977, early 78, here came an envelope with that issue of Gong magazine in it with my pictures. And I'm a whole, and a check. Right? They paid. I, I think I once got a check in like probably 1981 for pictures of Funk and Lawler and some other people. And I was just sending three and a half by five color prints. I might have $3 in it. I got a check for like $200, which today would be between five and 600 bucks. So this was great. It was better than Norm Keitzer and Bill After put together, to be honest. And the, the the gong magazines, as you said, they were beautiful because they were not full magazine page size, eight and a half by 11 like we have here. They're what, like maybe seven by nine, something like that, seven by 10. But they were thick bound and they had a, a flat spine. It wasn't really a magazine as much. I mean, some of them were what, 150, 160 pages? By the time they became weekly in the 80s and into the 90s... They got thinner then. Well, they were still pretty thick, and it was it became even more glossy. And that was the thing. The photography was the best photography, and it was glossy. Yeah. No wrestling photographer in the States had had their work presented like that. Oh, well, and because the way that the Japanese people read is... I don't want to say it's backwards. That sounds negative. And a lot of people are going to say, well... Cornette hates Japanese wrestling and Japanese wrestlers. No, the same thing as here. I hate bad Japanese wrestling and bad Japanese wrestlers. Or anything else bad. Um, the, the Japanese people read in reverse as how uh, Americans read in terms of, imagine if you've got a magazine, if you turn it over backwards, where the cover is facing down and the spine is on the right, that's their cover. And they turn the pages from from left to right instead of right to left. And so the front of the, once I saw that, that's blowing my mind. 
And then, like you said, the the cover, the pages were glossy paper, not the newsprint that the American magazines used. And there were huge color sections. I mean, the 30 or 40 pages of color, that was the first part of the book. And then you would go into these, you know, even more pages of black and white, but action pictures, not only of the Japanese matches for either company, but also they constantly sent you know, uh, photographers to America and covered the different American territories, focusing on not only the wrestlers that came to Japan from America, but just ones they thought might get over, whoever looked colorful or whatever. And Wally Yamaguchi did that for years. And Jimmy Suzuki. Jimmy Suzuki, who, you know, the he got more juice than most wrestlers in the territories. Linda Rufa. And, well, Linda Rufa was, of, of, even though she obviously, she didn't come from Japan, she lived here in St. Louis, but they sent her traveling around. Bill Otten did a lot of work for him. Uh, but anyway, then after the black and white photo sections and captions and et cetera, then you would have, obviously, I don't know what it was. It was all Japanese, but tons of text and ads and results boxes and Everything else you can think of in these magazines, it covered the world of wrestling in the whole country, you know, top to bottom. And it would show you merch that you had never seen before. They would show oh, yeah. you cartoons and drawings that were made like professionally of wrestling characters, like American wrestlers you would see in Japan. Like, oh, my God, it's a Terry Funk comic book or all these different things. Oh, yeah. The merchandise was vastly eons ahead of what it was in the United States where you might get a cheap t-shirt, but over there you've got everything. And the, you know, people have talked about that Abdullah, the butcher, Terry Funk had record albums, music records that were actually well, somewhat well thought of, or at least sold well. Uh, they had all that kind of shit. You know what else is really cool? It's a little bit after the time you're just started talking about, but like 1983, 84, some of the magazines. And by that point, Wrestling was so big that there were other magazines outside of the two major companies, uh, outside of Gong and uh, Weekly Pro. There were other ones. They would have stickers in there, including, like, spines for your VHS tapes. Like, yeah. <laughs> in 83 or 84, think about that, because VHS, what it was here and what it was there, they had spines of what you're recording off TV, the wrestling you're recording in Japan, here's something you could put on the tape. That's incredible. Oh, well, and that's honestly why that I was able to see everything was because of their advancements in, you know, home VHS and beta before, you know, it was very common or well thought of over here. But and that honestly, this was before that in 77, 78, and most of 79, before I got a VHS recorder, the you know, the pictures you're seeing of these, not only the stars, but the matches and in Japan, American wrestling fans would have been freaking out at the match. Talk about dream matches. You got matches that you could never see in the States because guys were in different territories. And at the same time, if even by just watching or reading the magazines, Brian, I've knocked the guys that they bring over for AEW, Tanahashi and Okada, whoever. Everybody looks the same, does the same shit, works the same, same kind of size, whatever. The major stars at the time, Baba, Inoki, Jumbo, Fujinami, Tiger Mask especially, and uh, Sakaguchi, fucking <laughs> all the supporting cast. Yeah, let's not go crazy. Well, but they they were all, <laughs> I'm not saying they were all great. I they, know, I know, I'm joking. They, I'm but joking. everyone was unique looking. They had different looks, sizes, personalities, gimmicks. You could, you could easily know exactly what everybody's great move was and everybody, whatever the fuck. It was not, and everybody completely different working style. Even though, even though Inoki trained a lot of that next generation, he was still his what he did in the ring was different and then what they did with that was different and then tiger mask you know and, and they to bring in not only the greatest americans but also the greatest europeans in anoki's case because baba had the nwa booking deal wrapped up he could get more americans you had 
the European style, the world of sports style, Tiger Mask mixing with all that shit. But not only that, in the heavyweight category as well, you had fucking Carl Gotch was the god of wrestling. But then, you know, here comes the Americans that are flamboyant and they get over to the funks. You know, it it was a melting pot, but every style was serious in its own way. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, because it was different versions of professional wrestling style combat, as opposed to at some point in the match, everyone's going to just point somewhere and run. Or everyone's going <laughs> to run the opposite way. There's so much more running now. I know it's there a silly no thing. There were no thumbtacks. There were no broken glass. That was it. Like, Maeda and Choshu and Fujinami and Anoki all wore black trunks, but they were all completely different styles in the ring. And it, 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 Teneru and Taruta even... Well, I didn't go to all Japan, excuse me. Well, no, well, I'm just saying uh, th those two, even though they were both mostly trained by the funks and were influenced by the funks, they were <laughs> had completely different appearances, sizes, styles, personalities. You know, so even even the guys that were trained by the same source, they they were more well-rounded because look at the talent that came through. And there was no, um, that's, that's where the, I don't want to say legend, but that's where the belief of even amongst modern day wrestlers and wrestling fans comes from that. It's an honor to go to Japan and wrestle because then it was because they could pick and choose and they paid great money. You had to be a top guy or a top worker or somebody they could do something with. And, you know, you had to ask favors sometimes to get booked in Japan and work your way in. Now, it's the same thing as the United States. They've got every kind of indie outlaw promotion in the world. Anybody can get the American garbage promotions go over there because the promoters fulfill their fucking mark dreams of running a show in Japan and selling out a phone booth and the guys make no money and do it for the experience. Now, it's not everybody. But it's a lot of people. But the, it was a an honor then. And again, you saw those dream matches with NWA world champions against guys from the AWA. And, you know, fucking in, incredible tag team combinations. And again, to go back to Koichi, any of the magazine coverage, if you picked up the Wrestling News or Wrestling Review or the Rings Wrestling and various other magazines and programs, any photos you saw of Hulk Hogan coming of age in Japan probably had the signature Koichi at the bottom. Yeah. And so many of those, like you said, the dream matches, every now and then you'd see a photo like, Dusty Rhodes wrestled Bob Backlund? What is this? Those are his photos. Yeah, and he, uh, they, uh, they had a different size, uh, regular standard photo as well back then where ours was three and a half by five. I think theirs were probably what? three by four or something is slightly smaller, but he always uh, autographed more or less photo Koichi, either on the back or the corner or whatever. His name was everywhere. And, you know, I, I, that, that's one thing that my mom got the biggest kick out of here. I'm 16 years old, right? And I'm taking pictures at the wrestling matches in Louisville. But when Two things. Number one, when I got a check from Gong Magazine for $100, and I'm 16, and it's the mid-70s. And secondly, she would always tell her friends, when you'd open up to the part where my pictures were, every word on the page would be Japanese, except in English, photos by Jim Cornette. And that just tickled her to death. And she'd always say, have you heard from Koichi? Has Koichi sent you a package so she could show people? But that was, you know, that was uh, that was the thing. He was everywhere at that point, and he was the one that really introduced not only the American newsletter writers and readers, but uh, the American wrestling magazine publishers and people to what was going on in Japan back in those days. There, like I said, there was no, you didn't just Skype people. There was no internet, and before home video, it really in 1980. You couldn't see this shit except through his efforts to get these magazines out and, and get 
better American coverage for his magazines. And like you said, I have in the files everything he ever sent in. So it's not just the photos. And every photo is labeled in English. You know, every photo, you know exactly what it is. But there's just envelopes filled with photos. It wasn't like he was just sending in one or two photos. He was sending in every photo he took and telling you basically to choose the best ones. But detailed notes. It's extraordinary. And it just makes you grateful and thankful that someone took it that seriously. Because... You know, it's easy for people not to, and you always need someone that will. And that's, you know, I I kept with the magazines through really the first part of 1983, because I've mentioned even when I started managing in late 82, I was still taking posed pictures. So I would send a few things in. They liked action. And that's one reason I, I have a lot of great color action stuff of some big matches like Harley Race and Tommy Rich in the Omni in Atlanta. Lawler and Bockwinkel in Memphis for the AWA title because after, and especially Norm Keitzer with his printing, wanted black and white because it reproduced better. But their printing in Japan was so much farther ahead and the they used color. So, And then when Terry Funk came in, shot a lot of that. And, and unfortunately, not the fucking bloodbath in Memphis. I didn't have color film, but... You you knew if, if Terry Funk was around, shoot color, and they paid more for color because that was a bigger section. But that was the thing is that, um, you know, it, this is how you got to know these these different wrestlers. And then when video came in, uh, I've mentioned my friend Walt Wolanski had a, a contact in Japan, and Walt made trips actually to Japan on a number of occasions, went to the wrestling stores. but. He had a guy over there that they already had nice quality VHS and beta machines in homes in 1980. And they started sending over tapes of those shows in return for American wrestling that now they were able to get. So we could get Japanese wrestling. If we'd have had VCRs, we could have gotten it beforehand. But when we finally did get them, we were able to start trading. And I have. Every program that Inoki and Baba aired, every weekly TV show from probably 1980 or 81 through the early 90s, still on tape. And they, would you agree, Brian, that the television production quality of Baba and Inoki's programs from the mid 70s through the early 80s not only blew away every television program in this country, but was better than Vince's when he first took over the WWF. Oh, most certainly it was. And important to note, it was also prime time. It wasn't just a wrestling show on, you know, not to say, well, Monday Night Raw technically is prime time, but this was prime time network TV. Network. Who was on which network? You probably know this. Uh, There was Nippon TV and TV Asai. That's right. TV Asai was New Japan. And Nippon was all Japan. And that stemmed from, in the earlier days, they were, uh, before Baba and Inoki left the original JWA, the Japanese Wrestling Alliance, and split off their own companies, the wrestling was on one network, and Baba was the big star on one weekly program, and Inoki was the big star on the other weekly program, and for major events, they would be a tag team, and well, goddamn, that was just swell, right? And then wrestling got so popular, when Baba and Inoki split, the other network, whichever one the JWA was not on, I can't remember, was able to snatch up their own wrestling program, and it was prime time network TV, they they had uh, newspaper coverage. This was a fucking legitimate professional sport in Japan, second only to, to baseball at the time, right? I mean, sumo was pretty big too, culturally. And again, that's why so well, many I, people were able to go. Like Tenru was a sumo player, performer, fighter. I don't know what you call them. A sumo warrior? A, what, what, what do you sound like, Shane McMahon? What do we call our wrestlers? A sumo wrestler is what they call them. Sumo wrestler. A sumo entertainer, I guess. <laughs> this is the greatest night in the history of sumo entertainment. But, you know, that's why, I mean, where was a big wrestling show held? Sumo Hall. So, I mean, sumo was still big culturally because it went back so far. Baseball, of course, that was the prime of uh, Satahara O. So, uh, you had wrestling there, too. 
But uh, but anyway, that was uh, that was the situation in the seventies, eighties, and really through, as we know, the the nineties, and then things like in America with wrestling started to go sideways. Apparently, but Koichi had kept up uh, with a lot of the reporters and friends that, and was still you know involved to some extent until recently. But uh, but anyway, yeah, he made me a lot of money and was a heck of a guy that I never met. I hate to hear, and I, he was only, so when I started corresponding with him, if I was 16, he would have been only 27 years old. It it seemed like I was thinking I'm dealing with this, you know, older Japanese professional photographer and newspaper uh, magazine fellow, and I didn't know how the whole thing worked, but he was barely uh, more than a kid like me. Very prolific, though. Holy shit, like you said, he was everywhere. That's right, and I'm going to go through my files and see what I can put maybe on Instagram so some of the listeners can check it out from Koichi, and we're hearing about the thoughts from Kornichi, I guess here. Hey! Hey, what? Kornichi. Come on, that'll never fly. 